If you have your Bibles today, the Lord's given me one of those messages that is, uh, I say it's one of those messages that we need to hear from time to time. Every once in a while we need to be reminded of this one important, powerful truth. There is no truth in the church of the living God today that Satan more energetically and emphatically works against than the truth that I will deliver my message on today. Psalm 24. If you have your Bibles and you'd open them with me. Psalm 24, beginning at verse number 7. Psalm 24, beginning at verse number 7. Hallelujah. I want to answer the question today. Who is the King of Glory? Hallelujah. Who is the King of Glory? Psalm 24, verses 7 through 10. And the King James text today reads in this fashion. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. Hallelujah. Amen. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment as we go to the Lord in prayer at this time. King Jesus, we are so grateful for the presence of God that we feel when we come into the house of God. We are so grateful for the anointing of the Holy Ghost that reaches into our spirit, reaches beyond our mere mortal thinking, reaches beyond our mortal emotion, and reaches into our spirit and causes the truths of God's Word to be celebrated that causes our heart to rejoice and our spirit within us to leap as we hear the wonderful truths of this gospel and of your word. There is power in the blood. Hallelujah. Oh, how our hearts rejoice today in the knowledge there is power in the blood. Power to destroy sin. Power to overcome addiction. Power to heal, to deliver, and to save. And then, oh God, we shall see the King. What greater promise has the church than this? And what greater cause of rejoicing have we than the knowledge that one day we shall indeed see the King, as the old song says, face to face with Jesus. Hallelujah. Master, the Word of God must needs go forth at this hour. I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I need you to touch me, quicken within me your word, quicken within me your spirit, that I might deliver this important message in a manner that is understandable, that is receivable, that is profitable for the people of God. Allow your word at this hour, O oh God, to penetrate not merely our hearing, not only our thinking, but our very soul. Oh God, let this truth today come to life 
in the heart and in the minds of every believer who would hear this message. Master, today we know that this truth requires revelation. That does not mean that the Word of God does not expound it, because certainly it does. But we need the Holy Ghost to quicken that Word so that we might receive it and understand it in our spirit. Grant to the O God revelation to all who would hear, for we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God and amen. I ask the question today, who is the King of glory? Hallelujah. Twice in Psalm 24, verses 7 through 10, we see the question posed, who is the King of glory? Hallelujah. And twice we hear the declaration made, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. He is the King of glory. Hallelujah. I'm here to tell you today, the question that I ask is very simply answered. It's answered within the context of the passage that I've read to you today. And yet it is important for believers to understand that there is far more to understanding who the King of Glory is than simply understanding that the Lord is the King of Glory. Many today, even within so-called Christian circles, do not know in fact who the Lord is. In the Old Testament, when you read the word Lord, and it is presented to us in the King James with all capital letters, that word is used in the place where uh, the title or the name Jehovah as we understand it would appear. Therefore, when the question is asked, who is the King of Glory? The Lord, it means Jehovah, strong and mighty. Jehovah, mighty in battle. Who is the King of Glory? Jehovah of hosts. He is the King of Glory. Hallelujah. Oh, but I'm here to tell you, Jehovah God of the Old Testament has presented Himself in a brand new fashion within the context of the New Testament. And if you would understand who the King of Glory is, you must understand today who Jesus Christ is. Hallelujah. In Acts 2 verse 36, the Apostle Peter preached, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. My goodness. In Acts chapter 10 verse 36, the word of God declares, The word which God sent unto the children of Israel preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. Hallelujah. In Philippians 2, 9 through 11, wherefore God hath also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 3, the Apostle Paul writes, Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus Hallelujah. 
God. God does not abdicate his title as Lord. Say, well, but Lord in capital letters in the Old Testament, that's just a replacement for the name Jehovah. Therefore, it's not speaking of God in terms of title. But listen, every Jew in Judaism, God wanted to drive home so powerfully his oneness, the fact that he alone is God and beside him there is no other. There is no deity, there is no person, there is no power beside God. He stands alone, he is unique in every single possible way. There is nothing or no one that is like him. In order to drive this point home, Within the context of the law, Jewish men are to take this passage of Scripture that I'm about to read to you. And they're to put it inside a little cube. And they're to bind that cube around their head with a string. And if you go to New York City and you live around the Orthodox Jews, the Hasidic Jews like I did, you'll see that they do this. If you look at pictures of men at the Wailing Wall, you'll see that they have a little cube that's attached to their head. What they don't know is that little cube is representative of the new Jerusalem, the promise of God to establish his kingdom forever in the earth. But within that cube is this little passage of scripture written and stored. And on every doorpost in every Jewish home, there is supposed to be this passage of scripture displayed. And as Jews go to God in prayer, they are supposed to begin every prayer with this declaration. Now listen carefully. Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, Jehovah our God is one Lord. What is that saying? That is saying he is alone and he is unique and there is no one or anything like him. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Now listen, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. Now you've got to understand something. Now you've got to understand that the Lord is also God and God is also the Lord. Jehovah is God and God is Jehovah. But He is... Listen. Deuteronomy 6 and 4, I just read to you Isaiah 43, 11. Here's what Jehovah declares. I, even I, am the Lord, Jehovah, and beside me there is no Savior. Isaiah 44 and verse 6, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, meaning Israel's Redeemer, when He says, and His, they, He's referring to Israel as the single person or the single man. This is common language in the Old Testament. Well, listen, thus saith the Lord, thus saith Jehovah, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, and Israel's Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Isaiah 45, 5 and 6, I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. Isaiah 45, 21, Tell ye and bring them near, yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? Have not I 
Jehovah and there is no God else beside me a just God and a Savior there is none beside me Isaiah 60 Verse 16, Thou shalt also suck the milk of the Gentiles, and shalt suck the breast of kings, and thou shalt know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior, and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Hosea 13 and 4, the Word of God declares, Yet I the Lord thy God. I am Jehovah thy God from the land of Egypt and thou shalt know no God but me for there is no Savior beside me. Over and over and over again Jehovah God declares throughout the Old Testament I am God alone. There is no God but me. There is no God beside me. I unique in every aspect of my person and personality. There is nothing that is comparable to me. And he says over and over again there is no Savior beside me. He says I am Savior. I am Israel's Savior. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 11 for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Two titles reserved for our God today. Oh my goodness. 2 Peter 2 verse 20. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. 2 Peter 3 and 2, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. 2 Peter 3.18 But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. To Him be glory. Funny, if Jesus were working for the Father and the Father were a second person, um, this passage would be completely contradictory to everything the Word of God teaches because the Apostle tells us today that Jesus Christ is both Lord and Savior and then he goes on to say, to Him be glory now and forever. To who? To Him, to Jesus be glory now and forever. Got news for you, children. God does not share His glory with any other. That's right. Mm. Isaiah 6 and 5, Then said I, the, apostle, uh, the uh, prophet Isaiah declares, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah 33 verse 22. For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord Jehovah is our king. He will save us. Isaiah 43 15. I am the Lord your holy one. The creator of Israel your king. Matthew 2 and 2, saying, this is the wise men coming to Jerusalem seeking after the child Jesus. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Wait a minute, no. 
that baby in the manger, that isn't the king of Israel, no. Because God, Jehovah, has declared over and over again, I am the king of Israel. I am the king of Israel. You can't have two kings. If one is a son and the father is the king, that makes the son a prince, not a king. Hello now. In order for the son to be king, the father would have to die. Well, I got news for you, honey. God ain't planning on dying anytime soon. And therefore, it is not possible that Jesus Christ be a separate person from God the Father and inherit the throne and become king. Oh, my goodness. No, the child born in the manger was Christ the Lord. Hallelujah. Christ the Lord. Jesus, the very name Jesus means Jehovah is become salvation. That's what the name Jesus means. Jesus is Jehovah God become our salvation. Over and over and over again in the Old Testament, he declares, I alone am thy Savior. I'm Jehovah. I'm God alone. There is none like me. I'm your Savior. I'm your Redeemer. I'm your King. And yet every one of these titles is ascribed to the Lord Jesus Christ. any more excited preaching a message than you get preaching this. 1 Timothy 6 13 through 16 I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth or makes alive all things and before or even before Christ Jesus who before Pontius Pilate Witness to good confession that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate the King of kings and Lord of lords. Listen. Who only hath immortality. Oh, oh. Woo, glory. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. He's talking about Jesus, folks. He said, who only hath immortality. Do you know what immortality is? You know what it is when you watch your movies on television or you go to the movie house to watch your movie and they talk about the immortals. That means somebody who is without beginning, somebody who is without end. Hallelujah. That's what immortal means. We are not immortal. We had a beginning. We had a birth. We had a start. We may live eternally. But we're not immortal. Oh my goodness. But what does the apostle ascribe to Jesus Christ? He first of all declares him to be our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he goes on to say that uh, which in time, in his times, he shall show. In other words, in God's time, in the Lord's time, he's going to show, he's going to reveal who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, listen, whom no man hath seen, nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. In 
1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 through 10. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. So Paul is saying to the church at Corinth, he said, we speak the wisdom of God in the mystery. He said, God's wisdom kept this certain truth mysterious and hidden, and God ordained that that truth should not be revealed until His church was born unto our glory. Which none of the princes, nobody on this planet, no matter how wealthy, no matter how well connected, no matter how learned, no matter how well educated, none of the princes of this world knew, listen, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. <laughs> Woo! Oh my God, if they had known who Jesus was, they wouldn't dare have crucified Him because they would have known you can put the body down, honey, but the spirit within is God. And that God will have vengeance. That God will judge. That God will hold you accountable. Oh my God, have mercy. He goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9, But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. When Jesus asked His disciples, Who do men say that I am? Some answered and said, Well, some say you're a great guy, you're, you're a prophet. Some say you're one of the great prophets reincarnated. Some say you're... John the Baptist once again living. The Lord said, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter jumped in, <laughs> as he so often did. And Peter said, Thou art the Christ, meaning the promised one. Thou art the Christ. You are the Messiah. You're the one that God promised from old. He said, The Son of the living God. God said, you are the only man ever born of God and God alone that has no father but God alone. And in that declaration, you see, the problem is we're a bunch of Westerners. We read these words from a Western perspective. We read these words from a Western mindset. I lived in New York City for 10 years. And when I lived in New York... And ministered in New York. I ministered in New York for like six of those ten years or seven. And uh, I used to love to ask, especially the Hasidic Jews, you know, the real devout Jews with their hats and their you know, wide brims and their long black coats and their curly cubes on either side of their temple as the law mandates. I used to love that, so I'd say, listen, I, please do not be offended. I'm asking this as a, as a theologian, and I sincerely want you to answer this question for me from a theological perspective. I said, who did Jesus Christ claim to be? I never asked one single Jew, and I mean, I asked, I can't even count how many folks, I never had one of them answer me different than this. God. Well, don't you mean the Son of God? No. No, He claimed to be God. But I thought He was called the Son of God. For a man to claim that He has no Father but God, He would have to be God Himself. 
because God doesn't have offspring. God doesn't create offspring. God has no need of offspring. And beyond that, it is impossible for uh, any man to claim that the Spirit of God abides within him and that he has a dual identity. He would have to be God manifest as a man. See, the Jews understand it because that's how the, you, you have to understand Jewish theology, Hebrew theology, in order to understand the Old Testament. In order to understand the New Testament, you need to understand it. The apostles wrote from a Jewish perspective. Whenever they would speak of the Lord Jesus Christ as a man, they very much, in essence, were looking at him within that context as a man. But that did not take away the fact that they knew that the mystery of God that was revealed to them was that within this man is God. You see, they understood him to be God, but at the same time, they you don't say in Jewish theology, you do not call a man God. That's blasphemy. That's, this is why the Jews wanted to stone Jesus at one point. Because they asked him, do you claim that God is your father? Do you claim that you're the only begotten son of God? And they didn't like his answer. And immediately the word of God said they took up stones to stone him. Because he was literally uh, he was committing blasphemy to make that claim. Jews are so committed to the law of Moses that they will not, even when it was God, they won't just outright call him God. Do you follow what I'm trying to say? So therefore, to play it safe, you might say, they simply use the title, the Son of God. A man born of God. They're saying this is God, but, but they're doing it in a way that they're kind of bypassing that restriction within the law that doesn't permit them to declare any man God. Do you follow? Amen. Now listen. A lot of scripture today. The word of God tells us that an understanding of Jesus Christ and who He is comes by revelation. And that's why when Peter declared, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, immediately Jesus turned to him and said, Oh, Simon Peter, blessed art thou, Simon Peter, for flesh and blood hath not revealed the Son to thee, but my Father which is in heaven, meaning the Spirit of God. When we speak of the Spirit of God, folks, we're not talking about some aspect of God. Jesus himself declared, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Isn't that what he said? So therefore, when, when uh, the Lord refers to something being revealed from God or by God, he's saying by the spirit. Do you follow? So he says, flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven, the Spirit of God, has made this revelation known to you. Many of us will hear me preach this message today, and yet for all the Word of God that they hear, they still will reject the message. Why? Because they don't have the revelation. You see, if you have a revelation and an understanding of who Jesus is today, you can thank Him for allowing you access to that revelation. Hallelujah. Because not everybody has it. Not everybody is part of this great fraternity. Thank God there are millions and millions of one God Jesus named people on the face of planet earth today. Thank God there are millions who understand this truth. But there are millions upon millions more who do not. Because they think 
that knowing who Jesus is. They think that knowing who the King of Glory is can strictly be achieved by reading the book. And if somebody can twist and pervert Scripture enough to convince them of another line of thought, then they follow that. Well, the problem is you're not allowing God to be part of the process. Because I'm here to tell you today, there was a day in my life when I was aware of this controversy. I was aware of the Trinitarian versus the oneness uh, controversy. I was aware of it since I was a kid. My grandparents, my family, had a friend of the family who was a one God Jesus named Preacher, Brother Warren Tatlock. And so ever since I was a kid, growing up in the Assemblies of God, I'd always heard about, you know, well, he believes a little differently than we do concerning the Godhead, concerning who Jesus is, and so on and so forth. And boy, I mean, I was steeped in Trinitarian theology. I, I grew up in it. I could debate anybody. I knew every argument. But Trinity, I still do. So those of you out there who think you're going to debate with me, save yourself the trouble. I know every full argument they have. And, and I know every one of them. Every single one of them. But I'll tell you the mistake I made. When I was about 20 years old, 21 years old, I sat down at my dining table in my dining room. My little brother Dallas was living with me. And one night I sat down at the dining room table and I literally said, Okay, Lord, I need to know and I need to know now. I need you to tell me. I need you to show me. I don't want... I said, I've got to make up my mind which is right. What's right? Is this right or is that right? Is this the truth or is that the truth? I want to know and I want to know now. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, Put your Bible on the table, on its binding, and then let it go. Literally. So I took my Bible, just like this. I took my Bible and I put it on my dining room table. I held it like this. I laid it on the table, and then I just let go of it. And it fell open. I looked down at my Bible and the first passage that my eye fell upon, the very first passage that my eye looked at was one that I read to you earlier. And it said, Tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. I had been raised and I had been taught ever since I was a kid that the Son sits, guess where? Beside the Father. Why, the Son, Daddy sits here, but the Son sits here beside the Father. And all of a sudden I'm reading this passage and it says, and there is none beside me. There's nobody beside me. According to Trinitarian theology, the Son has existed immortally and eternally just like the Father, which makes absolutely no sense. Uh, son is supposed to denote generation, but anyway, we won't go into that. And uh, so I looked at that, and then I literally just kind of went like this and shoved a few pages. And I looked down, and, and verse after verse, I kid you not, most of the verses I've been reading to you today are verses that I read that day over and over again. He said, I am the Lord, that is my name, and beside me there is no other. I am the Lord, that is my name, and beside me there is no Savior. Over and over again I read these passages. Tommy, it was as if I'd never read my Bible my entire life. I've been reading the Bible since I was a kid, and these passages never, ever seemed to say anything to me. 
all of a sudden, when I asked God to reveal himself, he used his word to reveal himself. And he said, I'm alone up here. <laughs> I'm unique up here. And the same God who sits up here is the same God who saved down there. Hallelujah. I told you over and over again, I'm your Savior. I told you over and over again, I'm your Redeemer. I'm the Savior of Israel. I'm the Redeemer of Israel. I said over and over again that I was the King of Israel. And yet every one of these titles is ascribed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh my goodness. Isaiah 42 verse 8, I am the Lord, that is my name and my glory, will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Isaiah 48 11, for mine own sake, even for mine own sake, will I do it. For how should my name be polluted? And I will not give my glory unto another. God said, I'm going to take care of it myself. I'm going to do it myself. You know why? Because that way I get the glory. I'm not going to let somebody else do it because then they get the glory. What did the Apostle Peter tell us earlier concerning Jesus Christ? He said, unto him be what? Be glory now and how, how long and forever. But Jehovah says, I don't give my glory away. No, I'll do it myself so that I can get credit. Hallelujah. Oh my goodness. It's like a man that loves a woman. Or a man that loves another human being, another person. You love your partner, your spouse. And you want to do something special for them. You got to drive hours out of your way. You got to spend a lot more money than you normally would. You got to put a lot more effort into it than you might normally be able to put into it. But you do it because when you give that gift to your spouse, when you give that gift to your partner, you want to be able to take credit for the whole process. Do you hear what I'm telling you? You want to be able to say, I, I saw there was some television show recently that I saw, and uh, the person had brought a gift to his wife or what have you and they said you know he had to drive hours out of the way he had to do this he had to do that uh cat that's what it was and uh he found out his girlfriend as a child loved this certain candy bar and he had to uh, research and find out if that candy bar was still being made. He had to contact the company to find out where that candy bar was still being sold. He had to drive two hours out of his way to go out of state to a store that still carried that candy bar so he could buy that candy bar for his girlfriend. You hear what I'm telling you now. Why? Because he wants the glory. Not just for the gift, but for the process whereby the gift was given and the gift was available. Got news for you. God said, I'll do it myself because <laughs> I ain't giving my glory away. Hallelujah. I'm sending somebody else. Can you imagine? Oh, I'm, I'm going to send somebody else to die on the cross. I'm going to send somebody else to go through the agony. I'm going to send somebody else to be tortured and to go through all this. The Lord said, no, for mine own sake, even for mine own sake, will I do it. For how should my name be polluted? He said, if I let somebody else do it, and I tried to take the credit for it, he said, mm -mm, that would pollute my name. That would dirty my name. Have you ever seen somebody try to take credit for something somebody else did? Oh, but I sent him to do it. Well, big deal. <laughs> big deal you sent him to do it. whoop de do. He's still the one that got it done. Am I telling the truth? He said, no, I'm not going to pollute my name. I'm not going to allow my reputation to go down the toilet because I sent somebody else to do it. He said, no, for my own sake, I'm going to do it myself. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, for God 
who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God is found where? In the face of Jesus Christ. Oh, children, I'm close enough today. Surprised. As much scripture as I had, you're surprised. I'm, I'm that quickly done nearly. Psalm 132.11 is one of my favorite passages. Oh, my great God in heaven, I love this passage of Scripture. The Lord Jehovah hath sworn in truth unto David. He will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. <laughs> Woo. Jehovah God swore to David of the fruit of your body David one day I will sit on your throne oh hallelujah Jesus Christ was born of the lineage of David hallelujah he is rightfully qualified to sit on the throne of David and the word of God said of his kingdom there shall be no end hallelujah oh I'm here to tell you today who is the king of glory the Lord is the king of glory who is the Lord God is the Lord who is God Jesus is God hallelujah in Revelation 17 and verse 14 lastly these shall make war with the Lamb and the Lamb shall overcome them. For He is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with Him are called and chosen and faithful. Hallelujah. Oh, who is the King of glory? The Lord. The Lord is the King of glory. Hallelujah. Is Jesus someone separate from Jehovah? Not even close. Even His name reveals who He is. He is Jehovah. But He is Jehovah come to fulfill what Jehovah said over and over and over again in the Old Testament that He was going to do. Jehovah said over and over again, I'm your Savior. Jehovah said over and over again, I alone am your Redeemer. Over and over again, He said, I am your King. And Jesus, the name Jesus literally means Jehovah's Savior or Jehovah's become salvation. So therefore, He is Jehovah. Hallelujah. He is Jehovah as Savior. And because he is Jehovah as Savior, the name Jesus is a greater name than any name that has ever existed. The Bible said God had given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. What does Lord mean? The term Lord, not the Old Testament Lord being used to substitute for Jehovah. No, no, no. What does the title Lord mean? It literally means one who controls. Lord is the supreme authority or the supreme power, okay? When you say someone is a landlord, that means they own it. That means they can make the rules as to how things are done on that property because you may pay rent, but they own it. And the Word of God tells us the Apostle Peter preached in the book of Acts concerning Christ. He said, He is Lord of all. Hallelujah. He is Lord of 
all. That would mean that God the Father, Jehovah, would have to have abdicated control of everything to Jesus if he were separate. But he's not. Who is the King of glory? The Lord. The Lord is the King of glory. And Jesus Christ today is King of kings and Lord of lords. And had the princes of this world known the great mystery that is embodied in the person of Jesus Christ, they would not have crucified who? The Lord of glory. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Hallelujah.